around this time, people were forming groups left and right, you know. I mean, I had a, I had a little Carter family duet with a wonderful gal from the South named Annie Bird, who played great auto harp and guitar, and I played fiddle and a little guitar, and so we had a little duo, and we'd play in all the little coffee houses around uh, McDougal Street and Bleecker Street, and uh, there was just a whole circuit of clubs we called basket houses because you played, the, the club owner didn't pay you, you passed a little bread basket around and whatever people threw in, that was, that was your take. And then you'd pack up your instruments and go around to another little club. And there was a whole circuit of these. And I also um, was in a, uh, and, and other people at the time who were doing that same circuit were like John Hammond, Bob Dylan, um, Richie Havens, Jose Feliciano. We all kind of cut our teeth doing that kind of circuit. And um, uh, I also was in a band very briefly with a wonderful, who's turned out to be just one of the great masters of mandolin over the years is uh, David Grisman. And we were all singing bluegrass one day and a, and a, a a club owner from Long Island came out and, and uh, asked us if we were a group and what, what was this folk music? They were trying to get some folk music out there in Long Island because I guess they wanted to get in on the big craze. And and uh, and he said, uh, what's the name of your group? And David just off the top of his head said, Maria and the Washington Square Ramblers. <laughs> so he gave, we actually got a paying job to go play at his Italian restaurant every Sunday. We got on the subway with our instruments and and they e paid us each twenty dollars which was huge money in those days that lasted about a month that gig so there were a lot of different groups forming and disbanding all the time and uh, one time I came to the park and they uh, David Grisman and John Sebastian came running up and said guess what we, we, we formed a jug band and we want to we're gonna make an album and this lady Victoria Spivey is uh, gonna record us and uh, I mean to just we were doing it for fun so the idea of just making a record was even beyond our wildest dreams. Victoria Spivey was a wonderful black woman for, for, who was an uh, original one of the original blues queens from the classic blues era. Um, you know she was a contemporary of my beloved Bessie Smith and and Ma Rainey and had big hits in the in the 20s and early 30s but she had survived all that and lived up in New York and was the first artist I know of savvy enough to have her own record label and she had seen them playing around and she was kind of talent scouting all the time for for people for her label and apparently according to the guys she had said now you boys play real good but y'all need some sex appeal up there now you ought to get that little girl I saw that went to pigtails that plays the fiddle and you get her in the band and then you'll really have something so they came running up to me and uh, and said guess what we're gonna have a band and make a record and and the, she said we need some sex appeal so will you join the band and I thought you, you have to remember now, this was before women's lib, so I didn't have any notion that I should be insulted by being approached this way. So it sounded like fun to me, and I said I would be happy to do it. And um, and then she took me under her wing, and, and she's the first one that turned me on to Memphis Minnie, who became a huge influence on me, as well as a lot of her own stuff, and oh, stuff by Ma Rainey and Sippy Wallace, and she, she had a lot of great records in her collection, so she really gave me a a schooling in the blues and also told me a lot about how to present myself and she said now you got to get up there and stretch your stuff and make all eyes be on you and then she would say that's what they call stage presence so anyway we ended up doing a, a, um, a record with the even dozen jug band and shortly after that I met uh, the Jim Queskin jug band and they had a very handsome very talented guitar player there named Jeff Muldar and um, before I knew it, I'd moved up to Boston to be with him. And shortly thereafter, I was asked to join the Queskin Band. And we ended up uh, making five albums over the course of the 60s and, and touring all over the States and Canada, being on a lot of TV shows. So uh, that was that was how I got professionally, you know, from, from my early attempts to being a recording artist, it finally came to fruition in the Even Dozen Jug Band and then the Queskin Band. And, and in, in um, Jeff Muldar and I, then when the band broke up, moved to Woodstock, New York, where a lot of 
a lot of wonderful musicians were the Paul Butterfield Blues Band was there, Bob Dylan lived there, the band lived there, um, just a, a Todd Rundgren. I mean, a lot, a lot of people were tucked away in the woods up there. Uh, and it was a wonderful time of kind of uh, cross-pollinization of all kinds of music going on, a lot of jamming and a lot of, a lot of fun. But, uh, and we made two albums on our own as a duo after the Queskin Band broke up. And then in, um, a few years after that, Jeff and I kind of after nine years kind of were um, coming to the end of our time together. And he joined the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. And I uh, got the opportunity at that time to make a record for Warner Brothers. We were already on Warner's uh, Warner Reprise label, and the president, Mo Austin, asked me to make uh, my own solo record, which I just thought sounded like a great idea because it was going to get me out of the winter snow of Woodstock, New York. So I uh, packed up my daughter, Jenny, and our dog, Honey Pie, and went across the country, s stayed in a little bungalow in Laurel Canyon in uh, in LA and started making my first solo record. Dr. John was playing piano, Jim Keltner was playing drums, Rye Cooter and David Lindley were playing guitar. And um, that was the beginning really of my solo career. And then I, I had a, a song on there that I put on as an afterthought because uh, the producer said, we just need one more medium tempo song. And I had had a very sweet young guitar player who had been very very uh, supportive of me and as I kind of was feeling my way toward being a solo artist, which seemed overwhelmingly uh, scary to me at the time. I mean, I was in the middle of, you know, just breaking up a long relationship and, and he had always been the, Jeffrey Muldar had always been the mastermind of our work together. So this was a whole new adventure for me, but um, I, I thought this young guitar player had been so so supportive and encouraging to me that as a gesture to him, I, I, I told the producer, well, this guy, David Nickturn, has a, a nice sort of medium tempo song. And, and um, I said, why don't you play him that Midnight at the Oasis song? And he whipped out his guitar and played it for the producer. And, and uh, the producer said, well, yeah, that's kind of cute. He wasn't wild about it or anything, but he thought, well, that'll kind of round out the album. So. We threw that on there, and God rewarded me for that little gesture toward my guitar player because for some reason, everybody found it just an irresistible song. Go figure, I don't know why, but people are still talking about it today. And I don't know if you heard when people come up to me every, uh, every night after a performance when I'm signing autographs or signing CDs. I hear so many stories about that song. People lost their virginity to it. People, I have pictures of babies that were conceived to it. I, I have pe people who got married to it, had their first romance. It, it just was a song that captured everybody's attention and, and imagination. So, and that went on to, you know, get nominated for a couple of Grammys in different categories and get a gold record. and. At that point, my parents were pretty proud of me and decided that it was okay that I had turned out to be a musician after all. <laughs> 